God, it's so polite little, little thing. Thanks, Jade, for the great introduction, and thank you all uh, for coming. Be sure to get some food, all the people that are there, too. Um, yeah, we're going to talk about making things. Uh, there's a great history of it here at CU. I see Phil and Steve, two of the leaders in the design build movement here at UC Boulder in the audience, and I'm glad to have them on the case. And Jade as well does design build. Um, I've been doing it for about a half a century, both in collaboration with the Jersey Devil Design Build Group and in collaboration with students. And I'm going to show some of the things that I've made and uh, kind of give you some idea, hopefully, of why we make them the way they are. And I went to architecture school in the 1960s. This is about a half a century ago, I guess. And uh, when I graduated from school, I joined with a couple of classmates to start. We never did a, uh, worked in an office. We started a design build firm called Jersey Devil, architects, artists, and inventors committed to the interdependence of design and construction. We had a s small office, just a post office box in rural New Jersey, but we we're pretty itinerant, working out of wherever our commissions take us. We do all the construction ourselves and typically live on site, either in trailers, or in crew built structures. This is one of the first buildings that we built. In the 60s, this is what we thought the future of architecture was going to be. Uh, <laughs> lightweight, air supported buildings, easy on the pocketbook, easy on the landscape, incredibly high in fantasy content, either the thinnest of skins between you and the outside or kind of hermetically sealed in these alien envelopes. And it was a fabulous fantasy, but it was a fantasy based on cheap energy. Enormous amounts of air had to be blown into these buildings to keep them from falling down, and enormous amounts of energy to heat them and cool them. So what we tried to do when we graduated from school was to retain the spirit of these buildings in more energy efficient package. Um, we started out by building houses. This is the first house we built in the Pine Barrens of southern New Jersey, about 1972, I think. We never did an apprenticeship. Maybe you can tell. I think if we'd ever worked in an office, we wouldn't have thought it was such a fabulous idea to build a column by stacking these 2,000-pound manhole sections, uh, framing it with curved barn rafters, sheathing it with cedar, and then spraying it with urethane foam. You know, when you first get out of school, you want to use every single idea you ever had in the first project that you get. Be careful of this, because the results are not always timeless. You can pretty much tell the era when that was built. That is a 1960s building for sure. This is another one from the same era uh, in New Hampshire uh, called the Helmet House. It's uh, also framed with Gothic barn rafters, sheathed with recycled newspaper board, uh, rigid insulation, and then ferro cement like is used in the, the boat building industry. And this is the first building that we got some national publicity on. The, uh, <laughs> it was in the Japanese architectural magazines because of the samurai look, but the uh, National Enquirer gave it the Weird Home Award, 1978. <laughs> so this is the first building that we built on the West Coast. It's our response to a steep slope in a seismic area, and it's actually an addition, let's see if this works, addition to an existing house across this bridge. Um, it's called the Football House. It's obvious reasons, and it's, uh, it's about, oh, about 45 miles south of San Francisco and about a quarter of a mile from the San Andreas Fault. And I never, uh, that in my architecture school background, never learned very much about seismic design. So we just sort of eyeballed it. We tried to do something that would be really spectacular if the big one hit. Maybe like an end over end failure would be good. Some <laughs> We suggested goalposts at the bottom of the hill, and he didn't, he didn't go for that or the AstroTurf roof. There's a uh, construction shot, liability issues, <laughs> design build. I'd like to show, start any talk that I give with these early projects. They're, a law, they're really old. Uh, we did them when we first got out of school. It's, it's amazing how much courage we had to actually go out there and build these crazy things and how much... Um, we had to learn and how much fun it was. It reminds me what a crazy time the 60s were <laughs> and how much those 60s values are responsible for where we all ended up. 
But there's some basic principles to these projects. The idea that the structure can generate the form, the idea that a building can collect and store solar energy, and the idea of um, local materials and simple geometry has formed the basis for the work that we've done since then. And the ecology movement came in in the 60s as well. We were really interested in that, how that would intersect with our work. We started in our on-site living conditions here. Donna's making some chocolate chip cookies in a solar oven, which is just an um, insulated box and a window and a, a couple of mirrors. And she actually burned a roast in that thing. This is a solar still that makes uh, drinking water out of seawater on a camping trip in Baja. And this is installing a water pumping windmill on the Hill House site in California. And the Hill House is the first uh, Jersey Devil project that brought all these environmental strategies that were floating around in the 60s together in one building. It's about 50 miles south of San Francisco, a couple thousand feet above sea level, and uh, maybe 10 miles from the Pacific Ocean. So nothing between it and these huge storms that come off the ocean. You can see the grass has just been plastered back against the hill. We had winds of 125 miles an hour on the site during this project. Uh, so if you want the building to be successful, you need to consider those environmental issues. So what we did was we scoop out the hill so that the wind would go over it, but the sun would still come in where we could use it for heating and for daylighting. And then by following the contours of the hill, we create a wind-free courtyard on the north side of the building. And by bringing the earth and grass up onto the building, we give it some ballast. And there's an attempt to integrate it with this amazing site. It's a pretty simple plan. It's like a curved ranch house. There's a kid's wing parents' wing with some public space in between. Um, and this earth berm in the form of the building generates that courtyard on the north side of the building, and there's a vegetable garden on the south. The cross-section is just kind of like an extrusion with some end conditions. The low winter sun comes in and is stored in that masonry floor for passive solar heat. Um, the overhang blocks the high, hot summer sun. We take advantage of the slope on site by putting in, this is a, called a trom wall. It's a dark painted masonry wall behind glass. It's fiberglass here. And the cold air falls by natural convection. It's heated by the sun and makes a little loop and heats the building. In the summertime, you can close a vent here, open a window, and actually use it to induce a breeze in the building. So you can use passive heating and cooling. He has a wood stove that he burns mostly for atmosphere, and he's never turned on the electric heat that was required by code. Here's some construction shots. The trom wall is here before it's glazed and painted. Utilities going in under the slab, pouring the slab with an overhead pump truck. And here we've got all the concrete poured. And we're using the old form boards to create a curved box beam around the south side of the building. And that would be San Francisco, which is about 50 miles north of the site. This is a concrete bearing wall on the north, post and beam on the south. And these warehouse trusses make a strong compound curved wing form that's responsive to the wind load on the site and sympathetic to the rolling hills that go down to the ocean. Uh, pine decking, plywood for sheer, rigid insulation, and then a very high quality hot, move, hot mop roof with actual drain tiles built into it. Um, if you're going to do an underground building, you need to do a careful job on the roof because a call black can be pretty expensive. And then we put on the, the dirt, it's four inches of ro road base and four inches of topsoil. We were a little nervous about um, driving a truck up there because it was wood frame. So we did it all with wheelbarrows and rakes. Um, this is a great example of what's possible if the architect is on site. As the builder, rather than back in the, ar in the office, the architect here is Jim Adamson from Jersey Devil. And, uh, Jim and I had some walls on the plan and we were prepared to uh, pour them in concrete and veneer them with stone from the site. And Jim Dempsey, who was doing the excavating work, was um, having lunch with us. And he looked at the model and he said, why don't we just forget those concrete walls and just use these huge uh, boulders that are all over the site? And it was a fabulous idea. And I think he suggested it because he enjoyed the challenge of doing that type of work and moving these huge rocks around. Uh, and he wanted to stay on the job for another couple of weeks. But he was incredibly skilled, and he could maneuver these huge boulders around as easily as we could move the small ones. Now, if you're going to do this kind of work, it's not a good idea to use your own truck. It says there, Vern's Rental. Very rare photo of an eight-ton boulder in a three-quarter ton dump truck. <laughs> One side is trying to dump, and the other <laughs> uh, side is spitting hydraulic fluid down on the driveway. 
So I managed to get a picture of it before it caught fire. <laughs> Send to Vern for Christmas cards. There, some people are taking notes. I see up in the front here are taking notes. I think the most important thing I could probably tell you tonight would be that in this kind of work, there's a time to use your own tools and a time to rent them. So it worked out okay. All that material's from the site. Here's a concrete arch we poured across the garage. Uh, foot traffic goes in and enters through this path into this uh, landscape courtyard. Those disks peeping out of the earth berm on the roof are solar collectors to preheat the domestic hot water. And standing about it, those collectors looking north towards the San Francisco Bay past the jacuzzi with its insulated cover. The difference here is this was taken maybe 15 or 20 years after we built the building. So if you make the building an armature for nature, as time goes by, it hopefully becomes more beautiful rather than becoming a maintenance headache. Um, instead of bringing in a roofer, you just bring in a gardener on a regular basis. This is the interior. Uh, there aren't any bearing walls, and we only did enough permit drawings for just the structure, so we were able to design and build the interior uh, with mock-ups as we were building the building. There's a lot of thermal mass, which is important for the passive heating and cooling, and a lot of hand craftsmanship. The uh, master bedroom, the headboard is cast into the bed. Um, he wanted to carpet the room, so for thermal storage, we went with the waterbed. Custom-made water. Remember those? Do we still have a water bed? <laughs> I don't know if we could find one of those. Uh, the ceiling is laminated out of utility grade one by twos. Uh, these are the days before nail guns, too. It's all hand nailed. The ceiling is compound curved. And there's a curved bifold door going into the bathroom. It's a pretty high level of design and construction on this project. Those early ones I showed and the early ones we built uh, were a little rough, and we tried to use. Um, ideas and technology from agriculture and industry to do something interesting here where there's obviously a little bit more money. It's nice to take a place where you would expect to find something custom like a door or a window and rethink that problem. So we built some of the windows and all the doors on this project. And this one is laminated out of redwood and then shaped with an automobile body grinder. The interior doors are thickened up so you can have shelves and storage inside them. And they have hand carved uh, door hardware. Yeah, these doors, uh, hardware was carved by Curtis Schreier of the old Ant Farm group. And this is a picture taken, I don't know, about four or five years ago. This is, house has been there since the late 70s. It's been through many uh, storms. Sort of water comes uphill just like out of a fire hose off the ocean. Uh, it's been through several earthquakes, quite a few earthquakes, and uh, actual fire that burned across. There was a house on this hill over here built the same time as ours, a typical McMansion, and it's gone. It's just totally rough climate. But the Hill House is still in pretty vintage condition and retains an intimate connection with the site that I attribute to the fact that we're out there every day for uh, a couple of years building it. Now, if you build your own work, um, you can take jobs in remote sites. You might not make any money, but you can take the jobs there. This is my truck and trailer about 1,000 miles south of the US border on the Baja California Peninsula of Mexico. Um, there's a, this is a hairpin turn with no guardrail, and I didn't think I could get the trailer any closer to the site, which was about a mile away, a retirement community called Punta Pescadero. Uh, Gringos leased the land, little tiny lots here, uh, for 30 years and built houses, and re mostly retirement houses. And in a lot of these developments, this one included their restrictive covenants that say what you can and cannot build. In this one, all the houses had to be covered with white stucco and have pitched concrete roofs covered in red tile. But they didn't say which way it had to pitch. So I thought if it could pitch to the center and out to the sides, it could collect the water, which would be a pretty good strategy in a place where it only rained four inches a year. There's going to be neighbors on either side, so privacy is a consideration. Here's a courtyard with a concrete trellis. Everybody needs a car everywhere, so there's a concrete carport uh, at the beginning. Concrete is the way to build things in Baja. There's really no trees. Uh, it's part of the culture. You don't need really sophisticated tools for masonry building, just a bucket full of hand tools. Everybody builds their own house. The neighbors come and help them pour the floor and roofs, and everybody knows how to build. So these are not professional construction workers. These are kids from the fishing village of Cardinal who worked with me on the project. We were able to get this gas-powered mixer, but just as often they'd mix it just on the ground with a bunch of shovels. The concrete comes from mainland Mexico in 100-pound sacks. Uh, 
There is some wood. It's used over and over again for formwork until it falls, uh, falls apart. So here, instead of forming all these beams, we form them one at a time, mix the concrete and pour it, a bucket brigade, to pour it up there. There is some steel, which is, was then subsidized by the government, steel and tortillas subsidized by the government. And I built this jig, and Carlos and Hanaro welded up 72, I think, hopefully identical fish-shaped trusses, which we hoisted by hand up to the roof, where they span from this vaulted beam in the center to flat beams at the edge. So using identical trusses, we uh, were able to develop this warp palm frond shape that would shed the water. We just rivet on some galvanized sheet metal, tie a cage of rebar, and with the mixer running from about 9 in the morning to almost 10.30 at night, the 35-man bucket brigade, we poured the roof in one monolithic pour, followed, of course, by a fiesta grande, con mucho cerveza. <laughs> I didn't know any Spanish when I went down there, and now I know how to. <laughs> yes, I know a few words now. And, a, <laughs> and then we waterproofed it against that four inches of rain uh, and put on the red roof red tile, but they didn't say it had to be roof tile, so I used floor tile which seemed to work pretty well on that compound curved shape. This is a chimney form, but there's no, it's not, you don't need a fireplace there. That's a vent for the roof, and these are vents here in the parapet. And uh, it's a double roof. There's a concrete roof below and top. So you're right at the Tropic of Cancer. The sun's almost directly over your head, and it beats down on that roof and heats up all the air in this uh, space, and it, it, it goes out through these vents at the top, so it pulls cool air in all the time, and it's constantly keeping a layer of cool air between you and that hot sun. And this inverted roof form, uh, in addition to collecting the water, uh, gives you, it's called the Venturi effect. It intensifies the breeze that comes off the water and squishes it as it comes through the building for natural cooling. Oh, oh these guys. Um, we're used to students, former students coming to the sites to visit. These are not some former students, although two of my students from University of Washington came down with one warm beer for me down there. I came out in the morning, and I, I, these guys were on the job site, and I was so shocked to see them. Does anybody here recognize this guy? Bill probably recognized him. Been around long enough. Yeah, I was surprised. That's Le Corbusier. Yeah, I thought he was dead, too. But <laughs> he's actually he's fine. He's, <laughs> he, he's living in Mexico. Uh, he's put on a few pounds. He's really happy to be out of the spotlight. And he's shown here with Luis Barragan. And they're having this giant argument over whose ideas I stole more of. <laughs> Probably equal, I would say. Uh, so Barragan meets Corbu. The desert meets the sea. The house has a bridge. These are little storage buildings. Here's a trellis going through to the sea. Uh, stones washed by the surf uh, laid in concentric patterns on the forecourt. These are celesia, they're perforated blocks of the air movement. This goes all through the whole complex. Uh, this is what it looks like from the beach, basically almost three buildings connected by a roof. And this is the only part built by some gringo friends of ours from Colorado, actually, from Durango, Colorado, um, the Sunflake Window Company, not in the business anymore. Uh, they built them here drove down, paid a big mordita at the border, and those are uh, mahogany and glass doors, and they fold open so every room has view and cross ventilation. So it's like a giant porch overlooking the ocean, the Sea of Cortez. And then the slab cantilevers over that stone base, and it's tiled inside and out with these handmade saltillo tiles, which, of course, probably a lot of them around here. They're pretty rustic. They have, uh, have little dog footprints in them. They're really hard on the furniture, but it's nice contrast to the architecture, which is a little rigid and rectilinear at the plan level. So there are folding doors from building to building, as well as to the sea. So there's a line around the house at seven feet that relates to that horizon line. Uh, so as you walk around the house, you get these constantly changing framed views of the Sea of Cortez, all under this pink uh, floating cloud-like ceiling. Jersey Devil's done a few public projects. Uh, would have helped maybe if we got licenses, would have helped get more public work. But uh, this is one we did on the Florida panhandle for the town of Seaside, Florida, which is here. This is the Gulf of Mexico. And these are the uh, dunes that are held in place by the sea oats and eelgrass. Uh, and so there needs to be a way to get all these people to the beach. And if everybody just kind of stomped the dunes, the dunes would erode and the town of Seaside would end up in the Gulf of Mexico, which is, might not be too bad of an idea. But the, 
uh, we were hired by the developer to do this beach walkover and beach pavilion. And the imagery is very simple. There, it's a beach umbrella and a series of waves. This is during construction. You don't want people coming up. And the, the foundation is just jetted into the dune. It's obviously going to be taken out of there by a hurricane someday. It's been hit by plenty of them. And uh, these are all treated wood. But the parts that you touch and that you walk on are juniper, which is eastern white cedar. So it's a pretty good smell as the sand abrades it as it goes up. And it's harvested. It's local. It comes from the swamps in Apalachicola, 100 miles from the site. Then it's milled and air dried at a place called Holt, which is 50 miles from there. So the wood, in addition to being renewable, is local. And the embodied energy of it is very low. Uh, the parasol is aluminum. It was originally going to be wood, but it turned out to recycle aluminum. Marine alloy aluminum was recycled aluminum, and it was um, cheaper was the main reason. But it was also lighter, more delicate, probably stronger. It took 160 mile an hour wind from Hurricane Opal, and more durable. We could put paint on there that has lasted so far since 25 some odd years. Um, it has its own rhythm as it goes over the dune, gets a little wider at the top, and becomes a place to uh, check out the gulf. The railings turn into the seats and then back into the railings and cascade down to the beach. This is what it looks like to an architectural photographer. <laughs> Rental tools, professional photography, two notes. That you see. He's writing it down. He's going to be a success in this business. Pretty good. <laughs> Seaside is one of the few places along the Gulf where sea turtles lay their eggs. And under the very best of conditions, a sea turtle egg has a 1 in 10,000 chance of becoming a mature, full-grown giant sea turtle. And if there's any light on the shore, they'll waddle towards the light and perish. So we've got, it's like one 30-watt bug light. It's, a hell, it's nowhere as near as bright as this dude, I'll tell you that. It's, uh, but you can't read there, but it is kind of a romantic place. So, and people have actually, believe it or not, gotten married there. Quite a few people have gotten married there. and done other romantic things, <laughs> like watch these fabulous sunsets that we have along the Gulf. <laughs> what are you thinking? <laughs> this is in Colorado. So in uh, Jersey Devil built many houses, well, I don't know many houses, because you build them one at a time. There aren't that many houses. There's a dozen or more houses that we built uh, in all kinds of different climates, and we always tried to make the house responsive to the climate. So this is in a place called Colorado City, south of Pueblo. Uh, it's a passive solar house for an airplane pilot. It's called the Airplane House. It's uh, hunkered in to protect it from those big winds that come across the uh, front range. And also a dark, strong, dark, abstract silhouette against the white winter landscape. This is at the edge of the Everglades, uh, the Palmetto House. And it is a live work house for a woodworker and a writer. The woodworking is downstairs here with a place to work outside, roll up doors. and. The writing studio is high enough to see the sunset over the Everglades, and there's a little kind of 700 square foot uh, living space in between with screen porches on the east and west as buffers against the sun. And this thing is, it's got uh, radiant barriers, cross ventilation, and an actual vented skin. All those vents, so that it's like a spacesuit where the air constantly moving through it to keep itself cool. This is in the Florida Keys. It's an arts compound. It includes a, it's a historic building from 1935, built by the Red Cross after a big hurricane. There's a new art studio, um, an air student trailer up here for the guests up in the roof, and then this living screen that um, connects the whole, the new studio and the old buildings and this stair tower together. And of course, things grow so fast there that it provides, mitigates all the fumes from the highway, provides a little habitat, and also grows food on the building. This is also in the Florida Keys. It's a school. It's probably the only school built in the south in the last 30 years without air conditioning. It's got a solar chimney at the top, so all the classrooms dump their air into a special, uh, into a central space for cooling. It's also raised up on top of a, a concrete base to catch the breezes, and that space below is cool, and we use that for arts and crafts. And this is, of course, of hot and dry, um, the, the lunar landscape of Palm Springs. Uh, scary out there. Palm Springs is searingly hot. Uh, it's seismic, so there's earthquakes. It's also, um, uh, there are also fires. Concrete is basically the way you need to build there if you want house insurance. 
So it's, uh, there's a recycled concrete, recycled styrofoam forms, and you leave the concrete in place. This is popular in Colorado, too, I believe. Rastra system, a living area and a sleeping area connected by a, a swimming pool and a misted area with shade. And even in the uh, outside of Washington, D.C., uh, for a heart surgeon and his family. So I spent basically 25 years <laughs> on the road back in the 20th century living in a trailer, building mostly single family houses. And it was a pretty good life. I didn't really have an exit plan. It wasn't always uh, sand and palm trees and stuff like that. There were some downsides. <laughs> and this happened, I'm going to say, 1993, 20 some odd years ago. <laughs> Oh my God, it brings back memories. I was, uh, I was pulling my trailer from Florida to California to do a project and I, you know, just, I had a muffler. Always get those mufflers fixed instead of thinking you'll get to California first. And you know, I had to take it as a, I burned up my truck, all my tools, my trailer. I was about to turn 50 and I figured to take it as a, as a sign that maybe I was out of tune with the times, that a middle-aged guy driving a 56 Chevy truck, pulling a 56 Airstream trailer, living on job sites, driving every single nail on his projects, needed to get a plan for the 21st century. So I thought maybe teaching would be good. <laughs> and it, you know, that's sort of the short story of how I got to teaching. And I figured, you know, I could use some health insurance. And it turns out that teaching is healthy in and of itself because hanging around with young people who are op still optimistic enough to think that their efforts will make the world a better place has kept me from becoming too cynical and certainly kept me on my toes. So I started teaching in Vermont, where I met Jade and Steve, actually, uh, at the Yestermorrow Design Built School in Warren, Vermont. We have a summer program. It used to be called Community Design Built when they took it. Now it's called Public Interest Design Built. And uh, students come from around the country, and in two weeks we build a small uh, community project. And this is a bandstand for the farmer's market in Waitsfield, Vermont. It's meant to echo the old covered bridges of Vermont. And of course, Vermont's got a, <coughs> like Colorado, it's got a four foot frost line. And you know, in a two week project for a couple thousand bucks, you can't be putting big footings in. That would take the, all the time and all the money. So we put it on skids. So you can put a bar through here, and you can actually drag it around that field, particularly on the snow. And it's a good thing we put it on skids because the farmer's market has actually moved um, three times since we built the project. And there it is. It was built in 1994, it says right up there. Um, there it is now. So Jim Adamson from Jersey Devil co-teaches the class with me and Bill Bylaski. There's Bill Bylaski. Bill is an architect in New York, is partners with Maya Lynn in her practice, since she's not licensed. And the emphasis is on hand drawing and local materials. There's a piece of fairly freshly cut hemlock rolling out of a sawmill, uh, probably run by one guy with about four fingers, who <laughs> pushes it through its back. would take you right back to the 18th century. Things haven't changed, and it produces something that's roughly similar to lumberyard lumber, but is a lot more sustainable since it's locally harvested and very little uh, production added to it. And we build a lot of the projects out with it. There, there is Steve Eckert. He does have a shirt on, but I wouldn't call that a lot of shirt that he's got on there. <laughs> Jade wanted to know if, if he had a picture of him with his shirt off. No, he's got a shirt. It's the wife beater shirt. He's young, he's young. Anyway, we built, we prefabricate these projects at the Yestermorrow School, which is an old ski lodge being converted to a to school, I guess. Um, this is, and we build these little projects at Yes Tomorrow and we ship them all over the state of Vermont. And this is a story time structure for the Magic Mountain Daycare Center in South Royalton, Vermont. This is a trail shelter for the hikers and cross country skiers on the Mad River Path. This is a Jade's class that built this as well. This is a school bus stop on a really windy corner where the old one had blown away. And uh, this is what that wood looks like after a couple of years out in the Vermont weather, and it matches the old barns of the area. And this is a rocket ship at the local trailer park. Trailer needs a roof to get through a winter in Vermont. There, the fillable housing. And this was generated because someone found someone giving away this old satellite dish. 
This is a mobile writer's studio at Shelburne Farms. And um, all the material was logged there at Shelburne Farms and milled at Shelburne Farms. And uh, the first guy to stay in this was Bill McKibben when he marched from his house in Ripton, Vermont to Burlington to get arrested to protest climate change the first time. He's been arrested a lot of times for that. And they asked him if uh, to give it a name. It's a mobile writer studio. And he came up with a couple of names. He said, uh, how about the sentence structure or the word chip? And actually, none of those caught on. It's called the shagging wagon. <laughs> so it didn't have anything to do with writing, I don't think. OK. Shelburne Farms got 30,000 school kids visited every year. So, um, and they had portalettes. So we are converting to composting toilets. This is at the maple sugaring uh, area. And this is at the market garden, a two-holer, which is in, has a sink involved as well. This is a 50-foot pedestrian bridge for the Dean Nature Preserve at um, Green Mountain College, which is 70 miles from Yesterboro. And the students designed this, and they really wanted to build it. And it was beautiful. So we tried, we built it at Yesterboro out on the tennis courts, this huge uh, glue lamb or screw lamb beams. And uh, we got this tractor trailer, and we wrestled them up onto the truck, drove the 70 miles to Pulteney, Vermont, to the site. And the Vermont College had this crawler that picked it up at the other end. And they had poured these concrete piers uh, right where we had told them to pour them. And they set the beams. Uh, this is Trex. That's plastic wood for the, to support the decking. And we had pre-cut all the decking and pre-cut all the railings. And we, we put everything in. And we were done pretty much by Thursday of the second week. It was amazing. And all that needed to be done was have it bolted down here, and a finish had to be put on the railing. And it was agreed that the, Vermont, uh, the Green Mountain College students would come back and do a work day in September. We do the class in August, too. And everybody, you know, we went back to yes tomorrow for our big graduation ceremonies. And then about a week later, Hurricane Irene came through Vermont. And all kinds of stuff was floating downstream. And this was pretty scary. Remember, it's not bolted down here. So, uh, but it turns out this is at the 100 year flood. <laughs> what? It is, it is. And it receded. Everyone was saved. And now there's a fabulous bridge going into the Dean Nature Preserve. And I asked them, I said, Have you guys bolted that thing down yet? They said, No, it's 100 year flood. <laughs> so I haven't even bolted it down yet. There's Jim. So basically, we've got a two week class, uh, usually 2,000 bucks always unskilled labor because it's students. And it's got to be able to go down the road. And we've been doing it for 25 years. And we've always managed to keep it pretty interesting. And it's definitely fun, as these guys can tell you. So if you didn't have a good design build program here, you'd want to come and spend a couple weeks with us in the summertime. You can come anyway and get credit, I bet. We'll see. Anyway, this is my, uh, my day job. This is the job that gives me the insurance. This is the one I'm really excited about. This is at the University of Washington since 1988. We have run off and on, well, continuously since 94, the Neighborhood Design Build Studio. We're on quarters at University of Washington. You all are on semesters. Semester. Quarters is a, we have 11 weeks for a studio. Same Monday, Wednesday, Friday afternoon. And we meet on Saturdays, too, for four hours. But we. Um, 12.30 to 5.30, three days a week. Uh, budgets are usually, used to be 7 to 10. Now they're 15 to 20. And we build the project someplace in the Seattle area for a nonprofit every spring and have been doing it for about 25 years. This is the Danny Wu International District Community Garden in Seattle's International District. There are about 100 plots here for low-income gardeners, mostly Asian refugees. In order to have a plot in the garden, you've got to be over. 62 years old and live in the ID, which m means most of the gardeners are Korean, Filipino, Japanese, Chinese, Vietnamese, mostly non-English speaking. Uh, but we have a lot of Asian American students at the University of Washington. Some retain contact with their, in with their uh, native la languages. And we were able to talk to the gardeners, develop a program and some priorities for the garden. And over the years, we've built a number of simple structures in an architectural style that's very familiar to the gardeners, um, not particular to any country, you know, but this sort of Asian flavor to it. This is a tool shed, a vegetable washing and drying area. These are raised beds. Most of the gardeners are elderly, so they can 
stand and garden and all cast in the concrete are all the languages that are spoken there in the Danny Wu garden. And this is a pig roast pit. For about 40 years, they've had a pig roast at the garden, which is a really important community organizing event. And they would just have it in a hole. And we built a much more kind of ceremonial place for it to happen. And this is a pig being roasted for my class to appreciate the work that they have done. The class has donated this plaque, which tells who the students are and who gave the money. And this bamboo tree that's enormous now, there's always a ribbon cutting and politicians will come and make speeches. It's a chance for the gardeners to whip up a huge feedback to show their appreciation for the students, a chance for the students to stay, what the, say what the studio meant to them, a chance for the dean to come by, usually for the first time, to take a little credit. <laughs> He's not the dean anymore, that guy. And local politicians. This happens to be a pretty good one. Bob Santos, who just died recently, who was uh, for HUD and was the uh, mayor of Chinatown there. And it's a great experience, first building experience for students. I mean, most architects, you finish your first project, you don't even get paid for the last build. This here, somebody bakes a cake with your name on it, says thank you. It's all, your career is all downhill from here. <laughs> but what this tells you is that when you do community work for people who really need it, things will work out well. And that's the message of our studio, hopefully. Everybody wins in a scenario like this. The students get to work for real clients and uh, learn something about building. Uh, the clients, the gardeners, get the fruits of all that labor. They couldn't even afford the materials. The uh, corporate sponsors get to polish their image a little bit by donating the materials. And the city and university get to take credit for having their community service routine together without actually having to do very much. And look what we get to build. It's a pretty fabulous statement in contrast to these monuments to unleashed office space in the background. What we're trying to say is that hand craftsmanship, ethnic traditions, and growing food are an important use of land in the city, which is a lot of things for a tiny project by a handful of architecture students to say. This is also at the Danny Wu Garden. It's down at the street level. There was a pernicious patch of bamboo here, and we're trying to cover it with some seating. We have a new, uh, it's a little park. There's a new street cut with a culturally appropriate gate some picnic tables and benches, and then this kind of rolling seating that seems to work for everyone. The bums roll out of bed in the morning. The businessmen use it during the day. And it's very attractive to kids. You know, what you must notice the playground equipment has become a lot more boring. Uh, and architecture students don't really build it anymore. We used to build a lot of it. But um, if I build seating and kids play on it, it works for me. This is, uh, we did two years ago at the Danny Wu Garden. And this is at the north end of the garden is a big housing block. Uh, there are a bunch of sheds up against that building and a trellis. And these, the doors are counterweighted. We poured little concrete pivot uh, panels in them. So you can hinge them up. And it, may, it covers this area. And inside here is a kitchen, uh, folding tables and benches. And there you can sit 26 people, which is the size of an elementary school class. And they come and pick food in the garden, clean it, cook it and uh, serve it and then close it up for security because a policeman has never been inside the Danny Wu Garden as far as I know and there's a fair amount of nighttime problems in there in terms of drug dealers, etc. So the class works in a group. Um, getting a design, a consensus design process is definitely the hardest part of my job but I've gotten pretty good at it. Uh, we don't start building until we all agree uh, but when we do agree, there's lots of people in the class to hands to put together a presentation. And this usually happens in the first two weeks of the studio while we build a number of individual projects. And usually by the third Monday, we make a presentation to the community. I've already set up that date before the class starts, so the students have to be ready by then. And we typically avoid in our presentation, we avoid architectural drawings. Most people can't really read plans. We definitely avoid architectural jargon. Um, a lot of my students, my clients don't even speak English. And when we get the feedback from the community, we come back to studio and for the first time in a studio, they begin to go past schematic design. They figure out what we need for materials, what the details will be, what the schedule is, what it costs. Architectural students are sort of genetically incapable of doing a takeoff or a materials list, but we have dual degrees, construction management students in there that just love it. So it's good. It helps a lot. 
Um, <coughs> and we try and get on site by the third week of the studio, end of the third week, beginning of the fourth week, or the weekend in between. And this is one we did 2004. I think this is at Noji Commons. This is 75 units of actually prefabricated housing for first time home buyers by a nonprofit developer, first time home buyers in Seattle, making 30 to 80% of median income. And you have this many people in here, I think you need a fire truck needs to come through. So that's the reason for this big, and, and you get some parking out of it. So this space was left over, and once everybody moved in, they, moved, they called us and said, you guys can do something here. And so we met with all the people that lived in the houses already, which was great. And they said, there's plenty of room for the kids can play anywhere. But we will, what we need is a place that, this is like a duplex with a huge family on either side of it. And so they said, we need a place to celebrate uh, with family, uh, we can have a barbecue that we can reserve and a place to sit outside and eat. And so there's the concrete is poured. Um, this is gravel, which is quarter minus gravel, which means it's ADA accessible, a wheelchair can go on it. This is wood, which is cedar, which we have plenty of in the Northwest and we try and use it. It's good for outside construction. And we use that bypass system, which is easy for students typically use it. Uh, it's good for exposed wood and it's easy for students to um, be successful at it's not quite as precise as some of the other ones here we're building a curved trellis those are the rafters the purlins and then this is a 200 square foot roof it's compound curved so it's shingled over a little picnic area and it's connected by this trellis to another 200 square foot roof over a picnic area and this of course the plants will grow up here and shade this one but the strategy here is that 200 square foot is the most you can build without a building permit in Seattle considered a good site. Now it's down to 120 square feet, but you know, we usually get uh, forgiveness instead of permission on this kind of stuff. It's seismic in Seattle, so you need shear panels, and we weld these up in our shop and send them to the galvanizer. And this is the dedication ceremonies, and there's typically music, food, adult beverages, speeches. Um, it's a great time to inaugurate the barbecue, uh, cut the ribbon, and turn the project over to the community. And these this studios have meant a lot to some of the students who have taken them and have been career changers. We've had a fair number of students go into building and design and building. We've had some go to work for nonprofits, some of whom have actually become clients for the studio. And all of them that take it think that they're better, have become better architects because they understand the repercussions of lines that they put on paper and how hard it is to build that stuff. So Seattle's a great place for this, for urban projects, small urban projects. There are a lot of community gardens there. This is Bradner Garden in Mount Baker. Uh, the things that my students can build that don't need permits are retaining walls, trellises, arbors, footbridges, uh, gateways, and pavilions. This one probably needed a permit, but we'll do it anyway. Um, uh, this one's shaped like a leaf, which is a good idea for the garden. And we prefabricated all those beams. This is the coffee shop at the architecture school on weekends. And we had a friend with a little cherry picker truck and we set them. The clients had poured these concrete columns of landscape architecture, designed them, and I think they wanted a little hat roof on there. But my students made these in the shop, these amazing brackets, and we set the beams and then we set up on site and did all the rafters and the skip sheathing. And we had a little metal break out there and we bent all the metal for the roof and did all the metal details. Amazing uh, workmanship. Here, a little pavilion that ended up costing like 13000 and if Parks Department did it, it would cost like 200000 and it wouldn't look like that. And this one was built in 11 weeks and if Parks did it, it would take maybe two or three years <laughs> at the community meeting. So, you know, Parks is happy that we do this, but it's fairly obvious that these projects wouldn't happen if we didn't do them. So the mayor at that time said you get forgiveness and not permission for this one. So it's all right. This is at the Washington State Arboretum, which is in Seattle. There was an old lath house right here on this exact spot that had lasted for 40 years out of cedar. It was falling apart. They had the plant sales in them and they hardy up the plants for the winter. We did this landscaping as well. Um, poured all the concrete with board form concrete. And there's a, there's a crow problem at the Arboretum. There's a murder of crows, which means it's like a herd of cows, murder of crows. And they pull all these little tags out of the plants. So this mesh is to discourage the crows, and we got that kind of mesh roof too, this little lamella uh, that we prefabricated that uh, in sections 
that uses small pieces to make this fan. We use the old form boards from the concrete for the plant stands, and it's on a south slope, so it's cut into the hill on the north. It gives us a chance to do a retaining wall to give the project a little thermal mass and some earth coupling to help the plants in the wintertime. We have done some stuff for kids, um, so if it lasts. <laughs> this one got moved. Um, the, the small kids can, it's at an Asian Head Start Center. It's called the Denise Louis Dragon. Uh, smaller kids crawl here, they get a little braver, they climb up and run through the body and slide out through the mouth. Sort of the reverse of what normally happens. <laughs> this is inner city elementary school. Um, uh, performance stage for double dutch jump rope and hip hop dancing made of recycled plastic and concrete. Uh, there's a jump rope shaped screen to keep the balls from going in these classrooms which face west so we did some sunshades on them as well. Uh, this is a playhouse for family services of King County uh, which provides a range of services for the homeless of King County. King County is where Seattle is and uh, one of my former students was the architect on this, their new building and they value engineered out the playhouse and a living fence. So she asked if we could do them. And we, I said, yes, we could do them. And one of the, we had a connection to 3Form, which is in Salt Lake City, which makes all this high-end plastic for expensive restaurants and things like that. And we got a donation to a truckload of it and cut it into two sizes, 12 by 12 and 6 by 12, and made these 7 foot by 3 foot steel panels and brought them out the site and put it up. Because what happened was that, um, Construction was behind schedule. It's a union project, and my students weren't allowed to come on a union job site, so they, that's why we look so good, though, because uh, <coughs> it is a union job site. And, but they gave us one Saturday to come. So we came out there at 7 in the morning, and we installed the whole thing and made it disappeared and left this on the construction site. It's meant to be like a patchwork quilt. It opens up, and uh, there's two storage areas and two playhouses. I did have one animation that I used there, 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 there. Because I told them I didn't have animation. But I'll have another tricky one later. <laughs> you guys. Uh, and the reason why there's two of everything is there's smaller kids and uh, uh, younger kids and older kids, and a lot of them are related, and they're, they're homeless kids, and they need to see each other. This is El Centro de la Raza, which is an uh, advocate for the Hispanic population. Uh, Seattle, this is an old elementary school that they occupied in the 70s and never gave the keys back. And now there's lots and lots of programs for the Latino community in Seattle. And the inside is just vibrantly painted with murals and everything. It's just fantastic in there. But the outside still looked like an old school. So we did this community circle, which brings a little bit of that um, flavor to the outside. We have two outdoor classrooms here. Uh, these flags we cut in our um, metal shop on the plasma cutter. And we uh, poured a bunch of these concrete tubes in different sizes. This is another one that when they have meetings here, community meetings, everybody sits there. But uh, the rest of the time, the kids can play around on this stuff. And Linda Beaumont, a Seattle artist, came and taught us how to mosaic. And the tile companies, it turns out, have a lot of tile left over from jobs, mismatched stuff. And we got, we got thousands of dollars worth of tile. And we uh, mosaic did all in a pattern that the students tell me is closely related to the Mayan calendar. <laughs> I don't know how closely it is. This is the urban farm. There's a few of those in Seattle. Um, it's UW Farm. It's at the University of Washington, but it also Seattle uh, Community Gar Seattle Garden Works, which is the uh, program for homeless kids that grow food and sell at the farmers market, and the Hardy Plant Society, which is a bunch of grumpy seniors. And they all had their little sheds there, little shacks. It's in a kind of a nice neighborhood, and the Center for Urban Horticulture asked us if we couldn't build one building for them all to use as for tool storage and a greenhouse and a classroom. They could fight with each other a little closer. And so we did. We built one. It's got an uh, outdoor classroom. It's got uh, tool storage here. The roof has got this um, diagonal ridge on it, which channels the water over to the sides. Uh, this is the wall is made out of compost stuff with stuff that directly from the garden, and it's, yeah, there's the, the water is collected on both sides. This is the view from the garden from the south, and this is the ribbon cutting. So that's the neighborhood design build studio. You know, when I started teaching at University of Washington and, and stopped traveling with Jersey Devil, the commissions fell off. 
like a rock. But I was able to do one project in the last number of years, last 20 years anyway. I was able, fortunate enough to collaborate with an artist on an island north of Seattle, Whidbey Island, uh, on this house and studio. And this is a, um, the site had been logged for fir, so these enormous cedar trees had grown there. <coughs> it was a beautiful site. The building is uh, based on the Northwest Indian longhouse, but in much more kind of durable and industrial materials. And it's a very simple form in a kind of a majestic changing landscape. But it's a pretty good party house, turns out. This is a picture taken at my wedding, because I married the client on this one. So it turns out to be my most successful <laughs> architectural commission. <laughs> pretty good. So. Now, I was 60 when I got married, though. But I waited. It was a moral victory to wait that long. But <laughs> you know, finally, after 20, 30 years on the road, I put down some roots. Literally, we've got this enormous garden that we grow a fair amount of food, uh, berries, and fruit. We started a family. We've got 30,000 bees. <laughs> so, and uh, I'm building these more utilitarian structures. Here's a greenhouse made of recycled windows. A woodshed, and a big art studio so that we can work at home. Hopefully our footprint will be a little bit smaller. Um, this is a pole barn. They build these in Colorado, I think, too, um, for agricultural structures. We didn't have a lot of money. We wanted a big space. Uh, so we had these guys come in and put in the structure's poles. Uh, all the framing is horizontal, and the metal is applied directly to it. And we can use, in our climate, black metal will work pretty well. Um, and these uh, panels, which are made by the Sunlight Corporation in New Hampshire, um, they're fiberglass panels that give beautiful diffuse light in the studio. And the whole building is pr pretty simple, um, inexpensive building. And I think it's like to say from going from using every idea you could in the project to one strong idea seems to be how you develop in your lifetime. If you can still get an idea, one little one, it's good I'm doing. And I'm still making things. They're a little smaller now. But I'm still, I think it's important to uh, continue to build stuff. Um, I make turn these bowls out of fallen trees and scrap from a friend's uh, cabinet shop. Uh, I've got a line of kitchen utensils that I do mostly for gifts. and. Um, I still get a few gigs on the lecture circuit. Usually I don't come for anything like this. This is more like home senior services and things. <laughs> so, <laughs> that just happens to be where the lecture is. But it, you know, everybody in there was about my age. So it, <laughs> it was not much happening on a Saturday night up at Lopez Island. And so in a half a century of building this stuff, look, people always ask which project. And obviously the Fremont Troll, which is a roadside attraction in Seattle, is the one that most people have seen and that has influenced the most people, I think, in a good way. And it's also the only piece of public art that was um, voted on by public vote. And uh, it was a competition that Fremont Arts Council got a neighborhood matching fund grant there in Seattle to do something underneath this bridge, the Aurora Bridge in the Fremont neighborhood of Seattle, which was booming at the time. And uh, I entered with two of my students Will Martin and Ross Whitehead and Donna Walter from Jersey Devil. And we thought, well, a troll under the bridge would be pretty good. Um, we, built it, we, it, we built this model. Wherever we didn't know about troll anatomy, we just slugged on a little bit more hair. Um, <laughs> we, <laughs> it turns out the troll's worst enemies are development and pollution. And they're very peaceful unless they're aroused. But he's obviously pissed off because he's crunching this Volkswagen bug, which some people said should have California plates. You have the same problem here, I think, in Colorado, too. Um, I don't know. The jury was kind of divided, I think. Some people thought it was really cool, and other people thought it was incredibly sophomoric. And we, were, we didn't get the $500 to go to the public vote, but they said, you can go anyway. You can go if you're willing to enter build a So we said, sure, we'll go. And the public voted, had no problem picking it six to one over all the other ones. So. We were faced with the, I, building this thing. You know, as architects, we build models all the time and scale them up. But this is hard. We did, uh, we cut through it. You know, now you could do it with a computer. We did it on graph paper. We cut the model, actually, on the bandsaw and developed this like an egg crate thing through it. And uh, 
we did a two foot grid of number three rebar and mesh. And the only real detail is like the fingers and this nose, which if you look at mine fairly closely, that's where it came from. And a Volkswagen was donated without a motor. Uh, and school kids came from all over Seattle to bring in stuff and put it in there for a time capsule. Uh, the art critic wrote some pretty mean things about it. <laughs> this is what you get when you let the public vote, you know, that kind of thing. So people came out to help us build it. And uh, here we're, we, we plastered this, this mesh with half cement, half sand, ferro cement. Uh, now we're putting on the layers of skin and, and hair. And we still, the budget was like 15 grand to build a public sculpture. So we raised a little extra money on site by selling Fremont Troll t-shirts, jumpsuits there, and shower caps. The shower cap is the ultimate fashion statement in a city like Seattle where there's always a chance <laughs> of showers. If you can find one of those on eBay, I would like one. It probably doesn't stink anymore. They have a scented shower cap. Um, and then we dug down and we found the old, uh, Street, Aurora Street, so Troll Plaza was done. All we had to do was pour this section and made it look like he dragged that VW out of passing traffic. These are retaining walls are made out of what's called urbanite. Those are broken up Seattle streets, which the city, of course, will give those to anybody. Uh, there's a leaking expansion joint over his head, right over his head. So all winter long, it's this drooly kind of stuff <laughs> comes down, which isn't that bad. And uh, the eye is a VW hubcap covered with prismatic diffraction grid. You know, the low riders have it. It looks like a rainbow trout. Um, changes colors when it hits it, it's silver. So when the cars come up over the hill, the headlights hit that eye and there's this blast of light. It's a drunk driver's worst nightmare. <laughs> and there it is at the fin fin dedication ceremonies. Uh, he's totally covered with kids, which he is all day, every day. The band is just getting down with some troll music. There's me in here. And a miracle happened. The sun came out in Seattle in December. You know this doesn't happen that much and illuminated the visage of the troll. This is pretty great. So he celebrates most of the holidays. <laughs> this is a Christmas effort by somebody. Uh, every Halloween he gets a bath. This just happened and, and a, uh, some mood lighting and there's this pagan celebration called Trolloween where maybe three, 400 people, mostly grown-ups, show up in costume and there's this wild dancing and fire drumming and then they march off uh, to a big party someplace in Fremont. And my troll coverall still fits, so I typically show up for a troll. I mean, I didn't go this year, but um, most of the time I will go. There's me being eaten by a dragon. It's a pretty fun deal. It only lasts for an hour because the neighbors really don't like it. And, so, and then they go someplace and have a really big party. Uh, yeah, it's definitely transcended public art. It, the city changed the name of the street, and it's, that sign is low enough so that it disappears all the time. They have to keep making more of them. People take them. People get married here, too. <laughs> <laughs> now, it turned, uh, it, I didn't take that picture. This, uh, I found it on the internet. But, you know, I got married. You saw a picture of my wedding. I've had three, three wedding pictures in here so far. Too. In case anybody is interested, I am an ordained minister, too. I could do, some, could do them afterwards during the Q&A period, maybe. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, what kind of person gets married at the Fremont Trail? I guess these guys got married at them, too. I hope they have a good life. They didn't invite me. <laughs> some people have got asked permission. They did, anyway. And it spawned a commercial venture that was quite successful to the troll artist. This would be the Fremont Troll Chia Pet. Some know what a chia pet is, that's right. Yes, the chia people are in San Francisco, and they called and said, Bartell Drugs wants to do a chia pet, you know, and it's just like Garfield and Shrek and George W. Bush and Obama and the rest of it like that. And I said, they said, what do you think? You guys hold the copyright. See, we kept the copyright on it, too. And I said, that sounds fabulous. This is great. <laughs> what a great idea. You know, plus it pay 88 cents a piece or 66, something like that a piece. But, um, I said, but we want the architect thing comes through. We want control on the design. And they said, just fine, because we weren't even planning on sending anybody up there. So they you know, went back and forth with a little Photoshop, and they finally they sent me this model, the, this little maquette, which I got them to change the hair to curlier. You know, usually they want it straight, so the seeds will take root in there and all this stuff. They had these requirements. And I said, the only suggestion we have was to paint the eyes silver 
And so um, I said, OK. And they press a button, and 20,000 of them were made in China. And they sold, this is at the clearance sales, but you know, it sold for 25,000. They sold 22,000, and the artist got 66 cents a piece. I do the numbers, man. Five artists. So five, uh, people at Arts Council. It was pretty good. It, the Troll is definitely the place to have your company picture taken, and you would expect that the uh, Slave to the Needle guys would have their picture taken at the Troll. But this is the Seattle Metropolitan um, Chamber Orchestra. Official photo. Wait. I got another animation here. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> These are Tibetan monks chanting at the Fremont Troll. <laughs> Again, I didn't take this picture. This came from the old Post Intelligencer newspaper. He's got a little teardrop on his eye that was right after a uh, guy got sh bus driver got shot and the bus went off the bridge there too and um, the troll became a big shrine with beer bottles and stuff afterwards so I just left that teardrop until it disappeared but it was there so there it is at the end of that long axis coming up from the ship canal it um, it makes the urban design statement that um, you need to make at the at the end of a long axis like this and with dead space under a bridge of which there's millions of square feet of all over the planet. It made the political statement, at least I consider it to be anti-development, uh, that Seattle and the Fremont neighborhood needed to make about 26 years ago. And it helped to start a community tradition, uh, Trolloween, which will hopefully be around a long time I'm, after I'm gone. A lot of things that the city got for less money than they would spend on a police car. And finally, to show that even the most humble structure can aspire to be both art and energy efficient, this is my outhouse in Vermont. It's actually a composting privy. Um, it's hard to see here, though, but it's, it's framed in wood. It's sheathed in cement board. And then these are mirrors from the dumpster at the glass shop and plates from yard sales. And my wife, Linda Beaumont, did most of the mosaic and with a Yes Tomorrow class, actually, some of it. And uh, this is, this is an actual entry, and that's a wall with mirror. That's Dave Sellers making a, taking a picture there. That's what it looks like in the wintertime, covered with snow. <laughs> There's a detail. There it is in the summertime. Pretty great strategy for the building inspector. You can see it, but a little bit of a problem if you're in a hurry. So you can't quite find it. Too. And of course, in Vermont, there's four seasons. So you get to see, well, you get them in Colorado, too. You get four seasons. But there's some fall foliage. This is how it works on the inside. Um, that's the back wall. So you can do it there. Uh, let's see. This is a 55 gallon, boy, I'll have a 55 gallon Ben and Jerry's ice cream drum on a car jack. This is running out of juice here. Um, and the bottom, about two feet of it is uh, sawdust, the curly kind. It comes out of a planer, and there's a pipe with some holes in it, and then it goes through and takes the fumes out of there, and you sit here. It's a direct drop, and there's a drawer there with some more sawdust. So every time you use it, you toss a couple handfuls of sawdust in there. Um, I use it all summer. My guests use it all summer. Uh, we come back the next year, lower it down, and it's light and fluffy, and you can toss it here on the ground and start all over again. Uh, you know, there's no stink, there's no flies. You wonder why we don't do it more often, the way that water and waste is becoming a problem in our culture. It takes something that we all have to do every day and turns it into a pretty fabulous experience. <laughs> I'm not taking the photo credit on that one. I, a friend of mine from Portland took that picture. All right, this is the only, we're at the end here, getting close, but uh, th this is the message, and we'll sugarcoat this one the day before election day, I guess. But uh, this is the only example of nuclear architecture I've got here. It's a cruise missile. It says, 15 times Hiroshima, danger, do not deploy in Europe. It gives incredible stature to this little shed in Warren, Vermont. And I took this picture many years ago, before the first Persian Gulf War, which is before a lot of you got the first Persian Gulf War was the early 90s, right? Uh, bef I didn't think there would be another one of those. Now it doesn't seem like we'll never not have one. Uh, before the first President Bush, I certainly didn't never think there would be another one of those. In a not a very <laughs> subtle display of his energy policy, deployed what seemed like a lot of these things on Baghdad. 
which we knew even at the time was the center of world civilization for 5,000 years, the place where the Garden of Eden supposedly was, the place where both writing and numbers were invented, so really where history began, uh, and the place where archaeologists used to work with spoons instead of shovels. And when we get done with it, it'll look like a uh, Daniel Liebeskin project. <laughs> yeah, where it's, that's a good Colorado version. But, uh, yeah, right here. It's pretty simple. Buildings use about 40% of all energy, which doesn't include the energy embodied in their materials and construction. Uh, nuclear energy, oil, and especially coal represent death and environmental destruction. Solar energy, renewables, and recycling represent sustenance and survival. So if you want to contribute to the continuation of the species, you'll design and build energy efficient buildings like this solar cape across the street. Recycling is important. This is a recycled, it's a 1960s Chrysler. I got the recycled the first three feet. They have a big saw at the junkyard that cuts this off. Um, and back here, we hinge the grill. And so this here, it's a Chrysler fireplace. It's a zero clearance, UL approved, outside air, energy efficient fireplace. Um, I couldn't resist bringing back these amazing taillights, Chrysler Imperial taillights. And this dimmer controls the taillights and the headlights. It gives this spooky kind of Stephen King flavor to the playroom at the Hoagie House. And to show that energy efficiency isn't confined to just modern architecture, here is the Chrysler Colonial Mantelpiece. All that's missing is maybe like a roadkill up here. A spotted owl would be good. <laughs> yes, tomorrow's election day. Most of us already, I hope we already voted. I think we, I hope we can avoid the apocalypse. But you know, I don't say that anybody in this campaign, except maybe Bernie, was an environmentalist. And that is the issue for you guys. The climate change, I mean, I'm done. I didn't breed. I, I, th I think, I think this, <laughs> I think this place will be habitable enough for the 15, 20 years that I might have left if I get lucky. But you guys are going to have kids, and you're going to take it over. We've got to hold these guys' feet to the fire. I hope we can avert disaster this time and still make it work. But your generation is going to make the real change that's needed, we hope. OK, that's enough message. This is me on the cover of the New York Times Magazine quite a few years ago. We didn't get on the cover, but we have been inside the New York Times Magazine several times. We've gotten a fair amount of publicity, way more than our 15 minutes of fame. We get invited to prestigious places like the University of Colorado to give lectures. And we've actually had a fair amount of influence on the generations of architecture students and builders. And uh, it's always a surprise to me, because I didn't show all the work, but there isn't that much of it. Take it from me. There's, there's I mean, maybe less than Antonio Gaudi, who had a pretty small career as well, which we would all trade and love to have. But um, there hasn't been much of it, and it's definitely not mainstream, but it has been influential. And we've gotten some recognition. I think it is possible to have a small operation where you design and make things very carefully, one at a time, and get some recognition. If you can stick to your guns and stay with something you believe in, and also if you retain a sense of humor that's essential to anything you choose for your life's work. So don't sit around watching the tube. <laughs> now we watch YouTube. What would we do without YouTube? Is this going to be on YouTube? These guys, the media guys, have got it all there. Bing, that's uploaded already. Um, toss that sucker out, turn it into a solar collector, hit the road, put the wind at your back in one of these Jersey Devil t-shirts, that's definitely eBay material, if you can find it. Uh, pick up a copy of Devil's Workshop, 25 Years of Jersey Devil Architecture. They put the funk back in functionalism, Michael Sorkin said. <laughs> this is still in print. Amazon, probably 40 cents or something like that. I don't know what it is. <laughs> 1997. And the Jersey Devil Design Build Book from 1985. There's a picture of Jersey Devil guys with their shirts off in there, too. It was young enough for that, too. That's a pretty good one, interviews with us. You can get that. That's out of print, but you can get it easy. And this is brand, it's a trilogy. This just came out this summer. And it's Design, Build with Jersey Devil, a handbook for education and practice. And it is a sort of a, it's architectural briefs. It's a how-to book on design, build, education, which I don't know. It's not a coffee table book. The other ones have better picks. <laughs> and when it gets to be your turn, go out and build something that doesn't become a burden on future generations. So that's all I've got. Thank you all for coming. Wow.